using the work of external parties. So guys, this is massive because I've taken three standards and I've combined them into this slide to try and make it all relevant and similar for you in terms of your thought process because all three are external parties that we as an auditor would like to use their work. And so surely we have to go through a very similar process with all three of those. So what are those three parties? Got it on the next slide. A management expert, an auditor's expert, and internal audit for the clients, the client's internal audit department. So all three different people that we as an auditor might choose to use. And you can see management expert, ISA 500, auditor's expert, ISA 620, internal audit, ISA 610. So now what I want to do, guys, is take you back here to this slide that I have now put down some commonalities, at least in the way we need to think when we want to use an external party. So before we get there, I want you to think about what we had to consider as the auditors in the pre-engagement stage when accepting the client. What did we have to consider about ourselves when we wanted to consider taking on a specific engagement or continuing with a specific engagement? As the auditors, we needed to look at whether we could comply with the ethical requirements, which was all those fundamental principles as well as independence. And then we had to consider whether we had the competence and the capabilities and the resources, including time for this engagement. Do we have the staff? Do we have sufficient number of them? Are they at the necessary expertise level? So do they have any knowledge of the industry? Do they have experience with similar clients? So there was lots of factors we had to consider about ourselves when taking on an engagement. Now what we're saying is we've taken on the engagement. We ticked that we were competent, capable, and there were sufficient resources. And we ticked that we can comply with the ethical requirements, and our team is busy with the work. But now we're looking at using an external party, which means we are going to take their work and use it as our own in concluding on our opinion. And surely, if we are going to do that, then we need to make sure that they meet those very strict requirements that we had to. That they can comply with the ethical requirements and they are competent and capable with the necessary resources because why would we bother doing it for ourselves and not for other people who we are going to treat almost as ourselves? So guys, if you were very comfortable with pre-engagement and the things we had to do as auditors, then you should be very comfortable here. Because the first thing we need to do is consider whether we can rely on that external party and those are the same things we had to consider about ourselves. Are they objective? So with us, can we comply with all those ethical requirements? These we just wanting to make sure that they are independent. Are they objective? So a standard way that we can test whether these external experts or management experts are actually objective is we can inquire with management and with the external party about whether the external party has any interests or relationships with anyone within the entity. So are they objective? Guys, there's obviously going to be a different objectivity requirement here for internal audits because obviously internal audits are paid by the company and so they have an interest and relationships within them. So we will look at our next page that will help us with internal audit. But at least for 
and auditors experts or management experts, how we test objectivity is we ask them both if there's an interest or relationship that could ultimately affect their objectivity. The next thing we've got to do is consider their competence and we therefore look at personal experience. How has our past experience with that external party made us feel about their competence for this engagement? I can actually go and discuss with the external party or I can look at their qualifications or any published papers or books. Maybe if they're members of a professional body, I can find that out. So there's multiple ways I can check their competence and I've only put down four here. So the important thing is when I want to consider using a person, I need to first have procedures to test their objectivity and then have a couple of procedures to test their competence. And guys, you're looking at about one mark at least for objectivity, but maybe three marks for competence. And you're going to put that down. Discuss with the external party about their competence, inspect their qualifications, inspect any published books, inspect their um, memberships with professional bodies. I put those down and I state, I have tested their competence by doing these. I have tested their objectivity by doing these. So often, guys, there's a mark for pointing out the fact that you need to test their objectivity and then test their competence. If these two get ticked, only then do we go and look at step two, which is, can I rely on their work? And how do I go about doing that? I first need to see if they have any professional or regulatory requirements that they need to adhere to. And then I need to look at their working papers. And I need to recalculate any of the things that they've done. I need to test any of the assumptions by comparing it to the market assumptions. So I'm going to actually review those working papers in detail, cross-check everything to supporting documents, and if I'm comfortable with it, we will use their work. Okay, so guys, this could be asked as a 15 mark question. And if that's the case, you put down all four of these headings. I must test their objectivity, competence, understanding of their field of experts, and evaluate their work. There will be four marks for putting those down. I then have a mark for their objectivity. I've got a couple of marks for testing their competence. I go and inquire to understand their field. And then I've got a good four or five marks for actually testing their work. Often, though, we don't actually have to do a full test on the work because it's not a one required that asks you to evaluate them, but often I just use them to help me get evidence. So I might just have a one marker as a substantive procedure which says use an expert to assist you with whatever work you need. And you'll see that later when we're looking at our substantive procedures. So if I'm choosing to use them, I don't necessarily have to work through how I go about assessing them. But if a question is specifically about using the experts, then you need to work through how you would go about assessing them. So a few adjustments to this depending on the actual external party I've got on the next slide. So I've said, for a management expert, when we need to evaluate the adequacy of their work, I can also add another procedure that says, use an auditor's expert. Okay, so I will do everything above for them. But then I can add one more procedure. So this would be an additional procedure to evaluating the work, I can go and get an auditor expert, okay? Because that's somebody who's more independent, 
than the management expert because management of the clients hired that expert, whereas me as the auditor would go and hire my own independent experts to assess their manage management expert's work. Okay. If I'm looking at an auditor's expert, I've got one additional consideration, and that means I need to have an agreement with the expert because the auditors are ultimately hiring this expert. And in that agreement, we need to have confidentiality requirements. Because we have gone and hired a third party to look at the work that is given to us from management. So I still have to have all of the above. I need to look at the objectivity, the competence, their work, and understanding their field of expertise. Plus now there must be an agreement in place with the expert by the auditors. For the internal audit, I said we do need to change objectivity. So I'm going to say, except for objectivity above, all are the same. Okay, so they have to go and consider the competence of the internal audit the same way as we've got on the previous slide. We have to look at the expertise, we have to review their work. The only difference is with regards to objectivity because they definitely have an interest and relationships within the business because they are hired by management, they work there. But how can they maintain some sort of objectivity? Well, their status within the organization. Who do they report to? If they report to the audit committee and later when we do King and Companies Act, we will learn that the audit committee should only comprise of independent non-executive directors, which means they are independent of the company. They are not employed on a day-to-day -day basis for the business. If internal audit report to them, they are somewhat objective to management because they aren't reporting to management. They aren't doing what management requires. They're doing what the independent non-executive directors require of them. Their status in their organization, well, if they do not have any managerial involvement, then they are or should be objective within the business. Okay, they don't make the big decisions, they don't report to management, they report to the audit committee, and as such, they are objective. Okay, so when you look at ISA 610, you will see this is how we consider internal audit objectivity, not by looking or inquiring with management. Okay, so you need to state your internal audit, this is not applicable. Got to refer to the next slide. I've also then added quality control. They need to have quality control measures within internal audit to make sure that they are adhering to the necessary standards and the work is at the necessary levels. So they need to have supervision and review. By, the, by managers and the superiors who are making sure that these guys know exactly what they're doing. They need to have sufficient guidance and therefore they need to have a policy on this to assist them in ensuring they maintain the necessary standards. Also, if they are members of a professional body, that would also prove to us that they might have quality control measures in place. 
Okay, let's quickly go and have a look at all three of these standards so you can see the similarities in each of them, but also the slight differences which are highlighted on this slide. 